What are a few of the dumbest crimes people will actually do? Was it because they were desperate or they were just that dumb? Let's find out. Starting with number six, Bachelor star gets busted for dealing. Marjorie Griffiths, a former contestant on the Australian version of The Bachelor, has been charged with being involved in an international money laundering syndicate that dealt illegal substances. She appeared on the 10th season of the reality series, paired with a 35-year-old restaurant manager, Thomas Maluccelli. She was in the show for 12 weeks. Days before her arrest, she was having the time of her life partying with her best friend, Molly Rosewarm. On her TikTok page, she posted videos of them at festivals and the beach. Then, hours later, she was in cuffs. What a fall from grace. Griffiths had supplied over two pounds of nose beers to an undercover police operative and another two pounds to an unknown client. But during her bail hearing, her defense attorney argued that Griffiths had merely been a courier, unaware of the contents of the packages she had allegedly delivered. Her lawyer tried to convince the judge that Griffiths was a mere pawn in the hands of a larger criminal network. The prosecutors lacked substantial evidence to refute this claim. At the time of the hearing, they also didn't have the testimony from the undercover agent who had allegedly received a package of nose beers from Griffiths. There was also no forensic evidence tying her to the cash, illegal substances, and other items the police had seized from her house raid. Which is weird, since literally that having all that stuff in her house wasn't enough to tie it to her. In the end, the former reality TV star was granted bail under strict conditions including electronic monitoring, curfews, and complete sobriety. She was also forbidden from possessing devices that connect to the internet and allowed to keep only one phone. Griffiths was released into the custody of her parents, which of course is embarrassing since she was 26 at the time, and to top it off, she was prohibited from contacting her best friend Molly, who had also been arrested during the raid and charged with possession. That Molly, we always knew she was a bad influence. The dumb thing is Griffiths is obviously an attractive woman who did attain some level of fame that could very easily be leveraged into something more lucrative and way less illegal. The easy way is almost never the better way. Number five, the TMI ransom note. Michael Harrell walked into the U.S. bank in Cleveland and handed the teller a note demanding money, which seems like a pretty average tactic as far as bank robbery notes are concerned. You hand the note to the teller quietly and they give you the money. Then you walk out the front door all cool, right? That's what Michael Harrell thought too when he handed his robbery note to the teller. But the problem with his note was that it had all of his information written on the other side. To be a thief, especially an exceptional thief like Hans Gruber, there's a certain level of cautiousness and common sense you have to possess. Harold lacked both of these qualities. The 54-year-old walked into the bank wearing a baseball cap and making minimal effort to disguise himself. He handed a note to the bank teller that said, this is a robbery, don't get nobody hurt. On the other side of the note was his name and address. He got the paper, which was a receipt or something, from the DMV earlier that day. Maybe it was the only piece of paper he had with him. Maybe he hadn't looked to the other side and had quickly scribbled down his demands. Nobody knows for sure. But the teller read the note, saw the details, and probably went from being a little scared to being annoyed. So she handed him a whopping $206, and after he left, she called the police. Like, the teller told the police that Harold was a regular customer at the bank, and that she had even called him by his name when handing over the money. Which means he would have been caught even even if he hadn't made the silly mistake. After the phone call from the teller, the police casually drove over to Harold's house and arrested him. It was probably the easiest task they had to do that day. We guess the lesson here is, well, there's so many lessons. <sighs> like first, just don't rob banks. If you do, don't rob banks you go to all the time. If you hand a note, just use a new piece of paper instead of whatever you have in your car. Maybe plan it a little bit so you don't just instantly get caught. If you're going to risk jail time, at least get more than a couple hundred bucks. Just literally do the opposite of what Harold did. Number four, short-sighted views. Long Fee Pham and two others have been arrested for their involvement in a high-stakes sports gambling scheme with Band for Life NBA player Toronto Raptor Jonte Porter. At the beginning of the year, Porter had incurred some gambling debts and was encouraged by some people with an apparent interest to pay off those debts by manipulating games so that certain bets would hit. So basically, he was throwing games. Before each game, Porter would tell Pham, who was a friend but also served more as a bookie, of his plan 
planned underperformance. Bam would take that info and go play some bets. Such as one time before a game versus the LA Clippers, Porter told Pham that he was going to take himself out of the game early, and he did. Porter played for only four minutes with zero points, three rebounds, and one assist before leaving with a supposed eye injury. On the other end, a co-conspirator cashed in on a $10,000 wager he had placed on Porter's minimal play. Before another game, Porter told his fellow conspirators that he would say he was sick to leave the game early. They placed their bet, and this earned Pham and the others over $1 million in profits. An investigation revealed that Porter placed at least 13 bets on NBA games, ranging from $15 to $22,000 using someone else's account. Not only was he limiting his performances for betting purposes, he was also disclosing confidential information to these co-conspirators. As a result, Porter was banned for life from the NBA. Porter's plan to pay his debts was extremely dumb for a couple of reasons. One, sportsbooks track betting patterns to find irregularities and flag extremely unusual bets, so the weird bets were bound to get flagged. Two, Porter at least had the potential to make much more legitimate money from the NBA than any amount he would have ever won from gambling. Say what you want about Pete Rose. At least he never bet against his own team. Number three, the Pringles prank. Ohio lawyer Jack Allen Blakes Lee was suspended for one year by the Ohio Supreme Court for tossing a uh, poo-filled Pringles can into the parking lot of a victim's advocacy center. A victim's advocacy center is exactly what it sounds like, a place that provides support, counseling, and legal assistance to individuals affected by crime. So it makes sense that he'd be flinging that smelly stuff like a naughty monkey, right? The incident went down in November of 2021, the date of a pretrial hearing for a criminal criminal case in which Blake Slee was the defense attorney. The executive director of the Victims Advocacy Center, Haven of Hope, had been attending hearings of this case, which is likely the why behind the act. On this particular day, the unnamed director was on her way to the pretrial hearing when she saw Blake Slee throw the loaded Pringles can. Blake Slee pleaded guilty to misdemeanor charges of disorderly conduct and littering and was fined $248. In the ethics case that followed, he admitted that his action was a disgrace to his profession. However, he also claimed that it was only a stupid random prank. We don't think there was anything random about this. And guess what? The Ohio Supreme Court didn't buy his story either. As if the case wasn't embarrassing enough, Blakeslee tried to prove the randomness of his prank by telling the court that he had done this at least 10 other times at other supposedly random locations, which is the worst possible defense he could have come up with. What on earth would that prove other than he's guilty of more crimes? Further, Blakeslee had known the victim's advocate for 20 years and had driven 20 minutes to toss the can of poop outside Haven of Hope, so there was definitely some intentionality behind the act. But it troubled the court that Blakesley had no substantial reason for doing this. Apparently, he had just done it. He said he harbored no animosity towards the victim's advocate or her colleagues, and neither was he trying to intimidate or threaten them. Blakesley allegedly expressed genuine remorse and promised to stop the inappropriate behavior. And even though he admitted to dealing with PTSD after his service in Vietnam, he didn't use it as an excuse for his behavior, because that would have made no sense. Just, you know, flinging poo in a Pringles can, like you do. What about the smell? In his car though. That dude drove at least 20 minutes one time with a Pringles can filled with the... Uh, if you got in his car with him, you know that smell had to have been wafting in the air. We have a lot more questions. Ah, Pringles. Number two, getaway Uber driver. Jason Christmas took an Uber to rob a Huntington Bank in Southfield, Michigan, and asked the driver to wait for him till he was done with the operation. In movies such as Ocean's Eleven, Inside Man, the robbers had these super cool elaborate plans for their heists. And despite what Rick and Morty would have you believe, we still like the getting the old crew back together scenes. They're fun. In another heist film, Baby Driver, a baby was hired to be a getaway driver or something. We don't know. We haven't seen the movie, but that sounds right. Anyway, the point point is, everyone knows that you have to have a good getaway driver or your plan will never work. However, Jason Christmas decided to just take the easy and convenient way out and in turn, and that made the police's job that much easier. Christmas ordered an Uber to take him to Huntington Bank, where he asked the driver to wait. So the driver did, until Christmas came back out and hopped in the back seat, having no idea his passenger had just robbed the bank. So the getaway Uber driver dropped Christmas off back at his apartment and went on his way. Through the surveillance, 
surveillance video from the bank, the police could see the Uber's plate number and track him down, finding him not too far from Christmas's apartment. The police then got a hold of Christmas's information and headed over to the apartment within hours of the robbery. Whenever you order an Uber, your identity is shared with the driver, and that driver can share it with law enforcement. So Christmas made it super easy for the police to find him, which they did, at his home, totally covered in red dye from the dye packs the bank had put in with the money they had handed over to him. So his hands, clothes, and even where he had sat in the Uber were stained red. He couldn't hide even if he tried. Also, for funsies, apparently Christmas got the Uber because he didn't want to drive on a suspended license. Figure that one out. The police suspected that Christmas probably committed the crime out of desperation to get gifts for his family because, well, at that time, Christmas was approaching. We do have to say that it's a bit ironic. Christmas was ultimately charged with bank robbery and was held on a $500,000 bond. Christmas was in such dire straits financially that he felt that robbing a bank was his only option, which must have been a terrible feeling. At least Christmas was covered in red during Christmas, so he was festive while being caught red-handed. Okay, we're done. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay right here to find out how she got her entire family into crime. Number one, burning it all down. Anita Gale Moody, former president of Enloe State Bank, was sentenced to seven years in federal prison for masterminding a massive fraud scheme. She started working in the bank as a teenager and climbed her way to the top, becoming president. The bank was the only job she ever had, and over the years, Moody embezzled $11 million by using over 100 fake loans to sponsor her boyfriend's and friends' businesses, buying a Jeep, and paying off her daughter's loans. So basically, Moody created fake loans to pay up real loans. Moody, who's disappointingly unrelated to Mad-Eye Moody, was exposed after a fire broke out in the bank's boardroom in May of 2019, right before a scheduled regulatory examination by the Texas Department of Banking. Someone had apparently stacked files on the table in the boardroom and set them on fire. Although the fire didn't get past the room, the entire building suffered smoke damage. Investigators soon discovered that the fire was an act of arson, so federal agents and Texas Texas regulators began to dig into it, and you already know what they found out. The bank's president of 10 years had set the files on fire in an attempt to destroy the evidence of her fake loans. After a thorough investigation, it was discovered that Moody had faked loans since 2012 in the names of various individuals, including actual customers. So there were bank customers who had no idea that their names and details were being used on loan application forms. Enloe State Bank was located in Cooper, Texas, a small town of about 2,000 people. The fact that Moody worked there from her teenage years up until she was 57 says much about Enloe's customer and employee retention rate and the communal nature of the bank. It was founded in 1928 and issued loans to cotton farmers since the Great Depression, so the bank had history. Sadly, the crime led to the closure of the bank, and Enloe became the first bank failure in Texas in over five years. It cost the Federal Deposit Insurance Corps' insurance fund approximately $21 million. In court, Moody revealed that her struggles with mental health and misuse of substances contributed to her behavior. Also, she had started taking loans to assist struggling customers, but later she reserved them for personal use. She admitted to starting the fire. Moody also confessed to using the $11 million stolen between 2012 and 2019 to fund the businesses and lifestyle of herself and her loved ones. Federal prosecutors charged her with conspiracy to commit bank fraud and arson. She agreed to a sentence of 84 months in prison and to pay a restitution of $11 million, the equivalent to what she'd stolen from the bank. You'd think that Moody would have been smarter than just trying to burn files to destroy the evidence of her crimes, since there were bound to be digital records as well. But apparently, desperate times call for desperate measures. Let's talk about some of the most despicable and heartless criminals around. Let's get right to it, starting with... Number 5. Crime Family Jody Bowie, resident of Failsworth in the UK, managed to live a life that most can only dream of. One filled with high-end designer clothes, flashy jewelry, and even cosmetic surgery. But the source of her endless wealth wasn't from her job as a caregiver, it was from her boyfriend, Jonathan Walsh, a crime boss involved in a sophisticated trafficking operation worth 1.36 million pounds. Jody's relationship with Jonathan began while he was serving a 14-year sentence for armed robbery 
and it quickly led her into a world of excess and crime. You just never know where Cupid's arrow will strike, right? The couple began a descent into the criminal underworld, orchestrating a sprawling network dealing in all kinds of illegal substances. After her arrest, the court's revelations about Jody's lavish spending during the trial painted a pretty clear picture of a lifestyle that was basically impossible with her ordinary job as an elderly caregiver. She spent her newfound riches on high-end designer clothing, luxury watches, designer handbags, and even indulged in almost 5,000 pounds worth of cosmetic surgery. On top of that, she splurged designer brands like Dolce & Gabbana, Louis Vuitton, Gucci, and Versace. Jody's association with her boyfriend's criminal activities became apparent, as it was obvious that the couple couldn't afford that kind of lifestyle through legitimate means. Jonathan had no declared income, and Jody knew full well where his money came from. Messages exchanged between the couple hinted at the extent of their lifestyle. Discussions of spending on cosmetic surgery worth 4,750 pounds and buying vehicles to facilitate their dealing were just the tip of the iceberg. But the story doesn't end there. Jody's drive to maintain this lifestyle extended to a more serious level when she recruited her own family members into the business. Jody involved her parents, Janice and David, and her older brother, Lee. They were brought into the network to make long trips from their home to the operations hubs. The contraband operation itself was a well-oiled machine, raking in a hefty profit margin. Jonathan Walsh's MO involved buying from wholesale suppliers, then selling it to dealers at a 30% profit. His associates and ensured that the operation remained secure and secret, using encrypted phones and a password system to protect their activities. Inevitably, as with most criminal enterprises, law enforcement became aware of the operation, and it wasn't long before they were brought down. A police raid revealed a stash of firearms and other goodies that characterized their criminal activities. Some couriers were even found to be carrying grenades. In court, the family members faced some pretty serious consequences. Jonathan was handed a 15-year prison sentence and Jody received a 21-month jail term, suspended for two years, along with a curfew and unpaid work. Jody's parents, Janice and David, were convicted of conspiracy to transfer criminal property, with David receiving a 10-month suspended sentence and Janice given 12 months custody, suspended for 18 months. In the end, the story of Jody Bowie shows that the relentless pursuit of an excessive lifestyle and easy money is a trap anyone can fall into, even someone's own mom and dad. At least she didn't end up like Tony Montagna. Number four, masking profits. An unnamed elderly couple from France took legal action against an art dealer who bought an African face mask from them for a mere 129 pounds, then turned around and sold it for 3.6 million pounds. It all went down out their home. Among the items they decided to part with was an African ingil mask from Gabon. The couple found a buyer who was known only as Mr. Z, which like, come on, Mr. Z? That's a bad guy name? Don't do deals with anyone who only goes by Mr. Z. Anyway, Mr. Z bought the mask at a low price and later sold it for a huge profit at an auctioneer in Montpellier, France. The mask was a rare find outside of Central Africa, with fewer than a dozen known to exist in museums around the world. It had been brought to France by the man's grandfather, a former colonial governor in Africa. The French couple was clueless about the true value of their artifact until they stumbled upon a news article talking about its sale for millions. Filled with a sense of betrayal and deceit, they decided to sue Mr. Z, accusing him of withholding information information about the mask's real worth. Court Nimes froze the proceeds of the sale as it deemed the couple's case to be well-founded in principle. The heart of the dispute revolved around the suspicion that Mr. Z was aware of the mass value but chose not to disclose it. Instead, he reached out to various auction houses for estimates on his value with the financial assessment coming from an African artifact specialist. The mask was eventually listed at auction with an estimated value between 259,416 pounds and 345,888 pounds, but it sold for much more. To avoid legal action, Mr. Z offered the couple the lower estimate. However, their children turned it down. So what do you think? Was it ethical for a dealer to purchase an item like this for so cheap, aware of its true worth, and resell it for a huge profit? Was this a heartless scam by the dastardly Mr. Z, or simply a savvy business move in the art market of buy a crafty Mr. Z? Let us know in the comments. Number three, out of gas. 
Scammers found a way to bypass payment at gas pumps, effectively hacking the system to siphon off gas for free. The scam employed a Bluetooth-enabled smartphone and, in some cases, a tactic to trick the gas station attendants. In one example, a Detroit man managed to steal nearly 800 gallons of gas, equivalent to almost $3,000 from a shell station. The scam's operation seems quite simple once you know the trick, which involved overriding the pump's system via Bluetooth, allowing the scammer to gain control remotely. The thief initiated this process process using their smartphone. While this was occurring, another individual often distracted the gas station attendants to minimize the interference. The station lost valuable gasoline revenue, which can add up to a substantial loss given the soaring gas prices. When attendants tried to intervene by shutting down the pumps to halt the theft, they were totally powerless as their pumps were controlled by the scammer. While the specifics may differ, this gas pump hacking technique isn't isolated. Another incident took place at a speedway station where the scammers employed a slightly different method. One person and distracted the clerk inside with a fake cash app issue, diverting attention while a second person hacked the pump. In this case, it was approximately $54. It's hard to feel too bad for gas stations getting ripped off, since pretty much everyone feels like they're being gouged at the pumps anyway. It's weird that these pumps have Bluetooth though, right? Why does everything have to have some sort of connectivity these days? Why would a gas pump even need Bluetooth? Number two, he's really sorry. Dean McCulley, a name notorious for preying on vulnerable elderly women, once again found himself on the wrong side of the law. With over 36 previous convictions for scams targeting the elderly, McCulley's latest reign of deception ultimately led to his latest prison sentence. His two victims, referred to as Mrs. C and Mrs. N, were elderly Auckland retirees, both living alone and enduring personal hardships. McCulley's scheme involved befriending these women and using guilt and manipulation to swindle money. McCulley had approached 81-year-old Mrs. C, offering to perform household maintenance work. He convinced her that her house needed cleaning, so she agreed to pay him $1,500. But this initial amount only marked the beginning of his sham. He came back later asking for more money, even accompanying her to the ATM to ensure he received an additional $600 to $800. Only after persistent calls and pleas for more money did Mrs. C realize she was being scammed. The second victim, 80-year-old Mrs. N, was no stranger to hardship. Having recently recovered from a severe stroke, she was targeted by Macaulay while working in her garden. He claimed he could clean her eaves and roof, and she agreed, handing him $520. Little did she know that this would be the first of many transactions. Over the course of a week, Macaulay bombarded Mrs. N with various tales of financial woes, pressing her to lend him more money. In total, he managed to convince her to make 29 transactions totaling $11,900. The victim, overwhelmed by by guilt and fear, felt forced into giving him the money. McKelly even went so far as to impersonate his bank manager or landlord during phone calls, further manipulating Mrs. N. When the weight of the scam became apparent, Mrs. N's family intervened, confronting McCulley and alerting the authorities, leading to his arrest. But the damage was done, as Mrs. N had been emotionally and financially drained. The court during his trial considered his extensive criminal history, which included 36 prior convictions for causing financial loss by deception. Despite Despite previous sentences, Macaulay clearly hadn't reformed. His consistent reoffending raised concerns about his attitudes, lifestyle, lack of consequential thinking, financial troubles, and an inclination to support criminal behavior. Both victims faced distressing consequences due to Macaulay's actions. Mrs. C, who had been widowed for almost 10 years and who also had recently recovered from a severe stroke, had experienced a decline in her mental and emotional well-being. Mrs. N, too, suffered immensely, experiencing a loss of independence, anxiety, and isolation. She believed that her stroke had changed her thought process, leaving her more susceptible to Macaulay's manipulations. With a history of relentlessly targeting of elderly women, it seems unlikely that he truly regrets his actions or is committed to rehabilitation. There's always hope that people can change and become a better version than what they are, but the sad reality is that there's just some people who need to be kept away from everyone else. Number one, the worst best man, Martin Galvin was given the responsibility of arranging trips to Prague and a day at the races for his friend of 18 years, Dino Carter. Galvin took on the trusted role planning Carter's bachelor party, but exploited it for personal gain. He managed to pocket 7,945 pounds from the groom and other members of the party. The money was intended to cover flights and hotel bookings for the upcoming events. However, instead of using the funds for their intended purposes, Galvin used the money on himself to fuel his gambling habit. Galvin claimed that he he 
might have bowel cancer, which led to several hospital visits and excuses to divert attention away from the bachelor party planning. When the group arrived at the airport for their trip to Prague, they discovered that the flights and hotel rooms had never been booked, and the money was nowhere to be found. Not only did Galvin betray the trust placed in him as the best man, but he also took advantage of Carter's empathy by claiming he had terminal cancer. The lie was calculated to point that he reduced his friends to tears. But Galvin's lies didn't end there. He persistently and boldly lied about his health, crafting a believable illusion of a man on the brink of dire death. In court, the judge didn't mince words when he described Galvin's fraud as one of the nastiest and meanest he had ever encountered. The judge was astonished at the audacity of the lie where a best man betrayed not only his friend's trust, but the sanctity of the role. Galvin was ultimately sentenced to 20 months in jail and ordered to fully pay back the 23 victims he swindled within one month. And it was over such a small amount. Don't get us wrong, 7,900 pounds is a good amount of money, but is it worth a jail sentence and the destruction of the relationship with all your closest friends? Hopefully, Galvin figures it out and gets the help he clearly needs. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section what you'd rather have, 50% more vacation days or 10% higher pay.